There was no follow-up at all in the gender identity disorder unit. Now, that is most extraordinary. Now, why not? You know, why is this the, this controversial treatment for these vulnerable young adults who are embarking on a sort of, you know, medicalized approach to basically what is a psychological problem? Why aren't we following them up? So what became apparent is the politicization of this area has really led to a neglect of the usual checks and balances. You must be some kind of therapist. I am some kind of therapist, and I'm about to take you on a journey through the inner wilderness. I've invited brilliant guests from all walks of life to join me as we investigate, illuminate, and inspire transformation in ourselves, intimate relationships, and the social ecosystems we are constellated in. What you are about to hear may surprise you, so hang on to your earbuds for a hefty dose of sanity in a chaotic world. I am Stephanie Wynn, a licensed marriage and family therapist, branching out and building bridges between psychology and everything else under the sun. It's my honor to have you along for the ride. Let's get started. Today, I am grateful to be able to welcome to the show Marcus Evans. Marcus is a British psychoanalyst who is known for being a whistleblower at the Tavistock Clinic in the UK. He's also written a book on gender dysphoria treatment for clinicians and has a wealth of experience working with gender dysphoria. Marcus, welcome. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Stephanie. It's a pleasure to be here. And you gave the whole in-depth background of what happened at the Tavistock Clinic on your interview on Trigonometry podcast. So for anyone who's interested in hearing that story, I would recommend they go back and listen to that because it's it's quite an interesting story. You also did an interview with Sasha Ayad and Stella O'Malley on Gender A Wider Lens podcast. We don't need to go over all of that, but could you just give a little kind of brief synopsis of your uh, professional background? Yeah, well, I was I worked in psychiatry in the National Health Service here for forty years, and I worked for twenty years in in our sort of national psychotherapy training institution. It's called the Tavistock. What I'm known for being interested in is the application of psychoanalytic ideas in psychiatry, and I get asked to talk about psychoanalytic understanding of psychosis and, and personality disorder. That's what I was known for, and then, as you mentioned, I After retiring from the National Health Service, I became a governor on the board of governors of the Tavistock Clinic, and there was a controversial report done by probably the Tavistock's best-known clinician, Dave Bell. And basically, cut a long story short, I felt that the trust were burying his concerns and the concerns of parents and the concerns of staff who'd spoken to him. And in the end, when I didn't get anywhere, when I was arguing the trust that they really needed to take these concerns seriously, I decided to resign because I, I'd signed a confidentiality clause, which meant I couldn't talk to anybody about it. But on discovering that trust were not interested in listening, I resigned and then got interviewed by all sorts of people who'd had long standing concerns. The other thing is, is that I knew about this because my wife had been the first whistleblower in 2005 and she said very similar things. So, you know, over the 16, 17 years, really nothing had changed. I thought that was quite interesting when I learned about that in listening to one of your interviews. Um, Your wife, Susan, was a whistleblower many years ago. And so these concerns have been ignored and covered up since long before the gender issues reached the the prevalence that they're at now. Um, so what are you doing now? Are you still seeing clients in any capacity? Yeah, no, I, I work full-time in private practice and Sue and I, I mean, the thing is, as a generic psychoanalyst, I've, I've seen all sorts of people in transition over a long period of time. As I said, I've been in psychiatry for 40 years, but we set up a, a service basically for gender dysphoric kids and their families and we've been running that and then we also thought that what was missing was a sort of psychological model uh, ironically the Tavistock's 
international reputation in, is in psychological approaches to family work and individual psychology. Well, I thought that that's what the Tavistock should be doing. It's thinking about what, what's going on with these kids and what's going on within the family. So, you know, decided to take this stand and my wife sort of started a judicial review, which was then taken over by Kira Bell. Basically, um, we thought well, we're missing a sort of psychological model so that's why we've written the book. And then we're learning a lot subsequently from our clinical practice. My wife sees mainly the, 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 the parents and the younger kids, and then I see mainly the over 18s. Considering the complexity of the subject and how much you've already written and spoken on it, I think it would be unfair to ask you to explain that in a nutshell. But I do still want to invite you to share a few of the key points. And I'll frame this by saying that you and I in different capacities and settings have both expressed, along with a lot of other concerned clinicians, that there's no reason ethically or in terms of best practices that we should step so far outside of the normal psychotherapeutic models of working with any condition. There's this notion of gender exceptionalism where You know, there's no other condition where we affirm the patient's self-diagnosis without question and kind of green light them through the medical system to rush into these life-altering procedures. We don't do that with any other condition. And so I'm, I'm guessing that many of the foundational principles of how you would recommend working with gender questioning is are really not that different from how you would recommend working with any other condition. And I'm imagining that for some of the therapists listening to this who might have shared our concerns in the back of their mind, but maybe not have heard conversations like this before, that for them, it might be validating some instinct in them that there is a more intuitive way to treat gender dysphoria that fits with what we know about good care in general. Well, I, I 100% agree with you, but I, I think just just to take it, you know, there are several levels of this. See, I mean, the reason that that Susan start with Mother A as the mother of an autistic girl started the judicial review was really down to the fact there was a failure of medical authority. I mean, usually in that, in the United Kingdom, you don't get involved with the courts about medical treatment. But what do you do when there's a failure of medical authority? The medical authority has been captured. You, you've got to turn to the courts. Now, what the judges looked at was where is the evidence base on which this whole affirmation model and medical treatment of young kids for gender dysphoria, what's it all based on? Well, they were shocked when they saw that it's all based on the Dutch protocol, one study, 70 kids, 20 of whom dropped out, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And there's been no other research of high quality, all sorts of qualitative research um, quoted. But really, these come down to a lot of qualitative statements about people feel better and a lot of beliefs expressed, but no what you call medical research with sort of randomised controlled trials in which we follow what happens over a long period of time. The other thing is I asked the medical director, I said, what, what about the outcome research? Now, I used to have to produce outcome following up patients that were seen at the Tavistock because the way we won our contracts was by convincing contractors who, who are holding a sort of government purse that our services were worthwhile by following them up and saying, well, the patient's improved in this, this, and this way. There was no follow-up at all in the gender identity disorder unit. Now, that is most extraordinary. Now, why not? You know, why is this, the, this controversial treatment for these vulnerable young adults who are embarking on a sort of, you know, medicalized approach to basically what is a psychological problem, why aren't we following them up? What became apparent is the politicisation has has really led to a neglect of the usual checks and balances, caution, good clinical governance, looking at the downside of treatment, you know, what are the long-term outcomes? It's all absent. 
and and as I said, you know, that really we're flying blind. This is like a sort of social experiment, medical experiment. The other important point to mention is the affirmation model was adopted despite the fact there's no evidence base for it, whereas there was an evidence base for watchful waiting, you know, that most kids, if supported, and, you know, you don't shut down the various that people experiment with their identities, well, that's what, you know, adolescence is all about, isn't it? You try being a bit macho, a bit feminine, a bit this, a bit that. You experiment, but don't, don't sort of, you know, set yourself off on a path that is rigid and and there isn't room for adaptation. So it's a most peculiar thing that we've done in this area. That's the sort of world that we're in, you know, for people to be aware of. The new the usual checks and balances and caution of sort of medical practice are absent in this area. And in place of that, you've got sort of ideology and beliefs as a sort of doctrine. So it's a very odd culture, because I didn't answer your question, but I was just looking at the sort of top level. But then, then as I say, you know, the, the usual practice of the Tavistock would be to look at the psychology of the individual in a thorough way. You know, what's going on with these kids? As we know, m- m- you know, many of them, and certainly all the ones that we see, and we see a selected bunch, because people, the parents of looked us up online, they know we're critical of current practices, so we're not seeing everybody. But the kids that come to us, they all have comorbid issues and problems, eating disorders, OCD, depression, anxiety, neurological problems. You know, they've all got comorbid problems. Well, the, the other thing that the, the judges asked the Tavistock, the JIDS service, was what are the comorbid problems of this population that you're treating? Now, amazingly, again, the Tavistock hadn't recorded how many of the kids had autism. You know, you'd think that's a key issue in terms of understanding what might be driving this wish for a sort of fixed solution, but no curiosity from the from the service. Again, and the service is taking place in an institution which is known for its interest in dynamic factors and family dynamics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Very odd. So I think that's your starting point. So it's a psychological problem. How do we understand what is going on with this kid? Who are they? What are they struggling with? As a psychoanalyst, always interested in the sort of structure of the child, the early relationships, et cetera, et cetera. And that our hypothesis, that's what you, you asked me about in the first place, is that you know, a lot of these kids are sort of, you might describe as anxiously attached. There's a sort of sense that they haven't sort of internalized a robust psychological system that is going to help them develop a mind capable of doing the things which we all need in terms of our development. You know, you're going to take, the world is not going to function as you would like it. You can't control the external world. You're going to find that it's not under your control. And then you've got to sort of adapt the way you see yourself, the way you, in relation to the external world. And one's got to have a sort of reasonably robust but flexible ego, in my language, in which you can sort of, you know, you, you can relinquish one set of beliefs in favour of a different way of seeing things as the, you know, the, the next challenge hits you. First day at school, you're all the best at maths in the classroom. Then you go to high school, you're not the best at maths in the classroom. You know, your mum goes to work, your parents divorce, you you know, you're gonna, you've got to deal with all sorts of psychological adversity. And, and our feeling is that a lot of these kids, they lack the basic structure to sort of deal with that adversity. And then when they hit adolescence, you know, and you get the sort of the influx of hormones with all that it brings in terms of the effects on the body, all the implications of of your developing sexuality, the role that you're going to be expected to play in society, 
expectations of sexual relationships, working relationships, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's as if the the kid is sort of not ready for that sort of trauma. So, in a sense, I think the puberty blockers they literally put a block on development, as if to say, my psychological structure cannot cope with the demands that are going to be put on it, and I'd like to shut the whole thing down. In fact, Domenico Di Celi, who started JIDS, he calls it a pause for thought. Now, one of the things that, again, came up in the trial was that the this claim of a pause for thought was actually not demonstrated in reality. The fact is that once kids get on hormone blockers, they get on a sort of medical conveyor belt They don't get off. You don't know how far they'll go in terms of surgery, but they go from puberty blockers to cross-sex hormones. So in that in that sense, the the sort of die is set, and the possibilities of their of their development are are sort of narrowed. Um, Sorry, it's a long answer to your question, but my view is that you're trying to help understand what are their what are they struggling with, and why do they want to narrow down the demands of what is after all ordinary developmental processes of course we know that adolescence most of us i don't know about you but <laughs> adolescence you know pretty confusing a lot of anxiety not knowing who i was all sorts of ideas of what i wanted to become fears of it's going to work out to be some sort of failure you know a lot of turmoil but that's that's ordinary and the, you hope the adults can support the adolescents in that tumult, which, as I say, I think is a part of ordinary development. And you support that by... Anyway, sorry, long answer to your question. Right. You support that by normalizing it, not catastrophizing it. And, you know, we've we've seen this increasing, well... Let me put it, lowering the threshold for what constitutes a mental illness, lowering the threshold for what constitutes something that warrants medical treatment, and now puberty itself, this normal developmental crisis is being seen as optional and a source of suffering that can be interrupted, that can be interrupted. You talk about that pause button, and all of us who are critical of these issues know and talk regularly about a couple of key facts there. One is that puberty blockers are not neutral. They, like you say, they put kids psychologically, they put them on a path toward transition and medicalization. Whereas kids, if they never went on those puberty blockers and they had a more exploratory approach, they would have a high, higher likelihood of desistance. We also know that puberty blockers are disastrous for the body and especially for bone development, but also for brain development. And many people who had dysphoria, but went through puberty say that puberty was the cure for their dysphoria, that they had to go through that crisis and adjust to those hormones to eventually make peace with who they are. Another point I want to bring up on the puberty blockers is when when it comes to this false notion that they just press the pause button, you said pause for thought. And I thought that was interesting because I think a lot of these kids don't actually know how to think. And the more time they're spending on screens and the more they're immersed in an online culture that's telling them what to think and how to think, what is it that makes us think that giving a kid this, you know, kind of buying a kid this illusion of extra time, that something magical is going to happen in that when you're halting your halting their development, that there's something that can happen during that time that they're on puberty blockers where their dysphoria can be resolved, where they can think more clearly. I, I don't think that's the case, but I have this long list of things that you touched on that I, I want to come back to. One really important point that I want to clarify is I often have the sense, and I want to check this out with you, that when it comes to the treatment of gender in the medical system, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. Everyone thinks that kids are being assessed, except for those of us who know that they're not, right? People like you and I who are having these conversations. There's this common myth amongst trans rights activists, parents who are naive to how these things work, doctors, therapists, a lot of people who are complicit in the medicalization of children have the story, well, yeah, this is the treatment that that kids are approved for once they've gone through a thorough assessment process. And people like you and I have seen that that's not actually the case, right? So some people think that if you send your kid to a therapist, 
that that therapist is going to do a thorough assessment. And only after doing a thorough assessment will the therapist recommend if it's appropriate to send the kid to the gender clinic. Whereas some people think if you send your kid to a gender clinic, the, the gender clinic is a place where they have experience assessing these issues. And, you know, I've I've heard lots of stories. I'm sure you have heard many of these stories as well, where a parent said, my kid was exhibiting gender-related distress. So my doctor told me to take them to the gender clinic where they're experts in these matters. And I was sure that, you know, when the experts on gender issues saw my kid, that they'd tell my kid, oh no, you're not you're not somebody who needs this type of treatment. We've we've seen thousands of people who do. And for you, it just really seems like this came on within the last year because of some conflict in your friend group. And so we we recommend just normal therapy for adjusting to friend changes or whatever the details of this case might be, right? So everyone's thinking if you just refer to therapy, you refer to the gender clinic, you refer to the professionals who are supposed to kind of take this from there. And then if someone goes on to recommend some kind of medical intervention, then that's because this kid has been assessed and they've determined that that's the proper standard of care. Now, people like you and I would argue there is never a good time. I mean, I would say, I don't know about you, but I would say that there's never an appropriate time to take a a vulnerable, naive child whose brain and body haven't fully developed and basically foreclose on their identity and make lifelong decisions that they can't, they don't have the developmental ability to consent to. I would say there's never a time for that. But even for those who operate under the belief system that there is a time for that, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding where I would put it as the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing and what the role of each professional is. And really, the role of gender clinics is to affirm. And when you talk about the psychiatric comorbidities, what I've seen from the belief system of the affirmation model is that all of those comorbidities are framed as being secondary results of the dysphoria. So the narrative gets twisted to be like, this kid was born in the wrong body, which in my view is an existential belief. It's a religious belief. It's it's not verifiable and it's not something I'm obligated to share. I view it as a metaphor that, you know, they're born in the wrong body and therefore all of these comorbidities, the anxiety, depression, ADHD, eating disorders, self-harm, OCD, all of this is because of their gender-related distress. So the gender-related distress is viewed as the root cause and everything else. It's it's kind of they're setting up the kids and the families for this expectation that if you, quote unquote, treat the gender-related distress with these medical interventions and social affirmation, that they'll feel better, that it'll alleviate all the other stuff, or this this has to come first and then we can work on the other stuff. But it's kind of like, Well, if they're anorexic, it's because, you know, she's in the wrong body and, or I'm sorry, they would say he, this female, is in the wrong body and is uncomfortable with having a feminine distribution of body fat. And that's why the kid is starving themselves. And so we just need to go ahead and affirm. And so the whole narrative, I think, is backwards. I think that all of these other issues, the comorbidities would be the root cause. But have you seen that as well, where kind of the notion of cause and effect gets twisted around? I was going to say, there's a, there's a lot in what you say, as you say to me. And let me just pick up some of the things. I mean, first of all, no one wants to experience a child in a lot of pain and distress. However, I, I, I sort of agree that, that you've got to think about the pain. You know, you, you've got to sort of and a lot of a lot of these kids, they don't feel they've got a mind, as I mentioned earlier on, in which they feel they can sort of suffer the pain. Like a lot of them, you say, well, what do you, you know, they say they're anxious. You say, well, what are you anxious about? And they don't really know because they, they haven't really got a very, very good way of observing themselves. So now that's not to persecute them. You've just got to understand where they are. They do put a lot of pressure on clinicians, you know, that often they're very persistent. Kira Bell, who took over the case, and my wife, she said, you know, she was really determined that she wanted to go through the transition and she would have fought anyone that stood in her way. So you've got to understand that's probably related to the fact they feel they found a solution to their psychological distress and they want 
the, the adults to help them um, follow up that solution. Because what we're wanting to do is know but why, you know, what's this, what's this a solution to? What are you suffering from? Who and why so fixed? Because because often in adolescent you think, well, if you narrow things down and fix on this one problem, one solution, that's the answer. But as you know, mature thought is usually based on the fact that our distress is usually complicated. There are different facets of it. And one's got to open things out and allow different possibilities to sort of um, be thought about. It's, it's it's the opposite of one size fits all sort of approach. Um, but I, I've got some I've got some sympathy for parents and for clinicians who are sort of in the front line of this. I think they say, "Christ, it's really difficult work." And, and, and now, really, you, in in terms of what you say about all the comorbid issues, yeah, there is a tendency to sort of divide things up. Like, as if, if you could divide up something called autism from something called gender dysphoria. In actual fact, one of the experts on the judicial review was was the guy called Ginsburg, who's the leading authority on autism. He said, well, of course, black and white thinking, and the tendency to go, that's good and that's bad, very much fits with gender ide- ideology. And that's why these kids are so prone to being pulled into the gender ideology. As you say, it's not... It's not that autism is secondary, it's primary, if you like. Same for eating disorders. Eating disorders is all about control of the appetites and the mind. And in a way, a lot of these distress kids are looking for control over them, their minds. So I would say, again, I'm going to sort of look at this on two levels. Are this sort of, in terms of what we should be doing in mental health, as you say, I certainly have never before been asked if a patient says to me, you know, I'm Henry VIII, I don't say, well, that's impossible because he died 600 years ago, but nor do I say, well, how does it feel to be the founder of the Church of England? You know, I sort of think, well, what, what's, what's he trying to communicate? Why, why has he adopted this belief system? I'm trying to sort of open things out, like, has he been beastly to his wife? You know, as Henry VIII, I think, had two what. Maybe three, maybe three wives beheaded, but you know, you know what, what's what's he trying to communicate? So I neither agree nor do I disagree. My job's to understand what's the the, the thing underlying that. When working with a with a kid, so I've, I've got very strong views on the the direction that we've taken in mental health, and and in terms of the policies, and in terms of the medicalisation, um, you know, as a as a sort of quick fix with long-term problems. As a therapist, I don't see myself as a gatekeeper. My, my job is to say, who's this kid? What are they struggling with? Can I understand them? I'm worried that if their actions, they say to me, I'm going to take testosterone, it worries me, and I'll discuss my worries with them. I, I sometimes feel that the whole issue, as, as you're saying, it's a sort of, that you know the gender clinics often say it's primary for me it's a cloak that the that the child is hiding other issues behind and i'm trying to understand what's behind this you know what is what is going on with this kid and can we throw some light on it i understand that if we we do that in a sense you they feel they've got the solution to their problems you're the gatekeeper. If you're only Mr. Evans says to the parents, yeah, that's fine. They're really, you know, they're, they're really trans. They can go through onto the medical pathway. Then I'll be allowed to pass go, as it were. But my, my job is, I'm not the gatekeeper. My job is to say, look, I'm here for you. I know you've, you, you don't like thinking about yourself. But I'm going to try and help understand why that is. And, try to explore things and look at things in a different way i'm not either working for the parents either i'm very sympathetic you know if i had kids and they wanted to transition i'd be beside myself as many of these parents are and i'd worry that the damage they do but as a therapist i'm saying to the kid 
But I've got no agenda apart from to understand what's what's making you tick. And in the end, I say, you know, you may decide you've got to decide how you're going to live your life. I'm I'm seeing the upper age group, so that many of these are, they've reached majority. They're eighteen. I still think there should be thought. I still think you should be cautious. I still think there could be exploration. But I'm not there to say how the kids should live their life. I'm there to say it's, you know, it's a good policy in life, especially when making important decisions to try and understand what's driving this belief system. Who are you? What are you struggling with? And, and, and I'm wanting to help you think as thoroughly as possible about that. So what do you think about the ages of 18 to 25 in particular? Because at 18 in the US and the UK, someone reaches the age of majority, but we know that the brain isn't fully developed until the mid-20s. I think that can be an especially vulnerable time for so many reasons, but one of those being that yeah, they, they are in a position to make these lifelong decisions and you want to help them think about it, but also they're just not fully capable uh, because they don't have the life experience or the, you know, the neurodevelopmental capacity either. What do you think about that age mm. range and, and their decision-making abilities? Yeah. As I say, a lot of the young adults that I see, they're quite behind on their sort of emotional development you know they're often very attached to their parents they're often you know they haven't had sexual relations they're 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 often as you were saying earlier on they're living on lines that they're quite dissociated from their bodies they don't like their instincts their appetites They're, they're living in their heads they look at their body as the enemy in some way and I, I agree with you, you know, legally, they can make various different decisions. I think psychologically, you know, I don't think they're ready to make those sorts of decisions. At, so I would, I think my, my, my position is always to rigorously stand for a sort of a thorough investigation of what's going on and hold out for that and slow things down and take time and um, so I, my previous statement wasn't about saying, oh, well, they've reached majority and that's fine, they can do what they want. I suppose what I'm trying to say is I, I'm sort of also, and this is not from a policy point of view, just to make that clear, but as a therapist with an 18-year-old, I say, look, I'm here because you think I'm working for your parents with their agenda. In actual fact, I'm here because I'm trying to understand you and I'm going to do that to the best of my ability. And that's going to be as rigorously as I possibly can. But also to pull us out of this sort of fight, but there's the authority and they're battling because they're saying, you're just trying to stop me being who I want to be. See, you end up in a sort of dog fight and I'm trying to find a sort of third position in which to say, okay, I get that, but let, let's try and work together on this. And in doing that, I've got to sort of, sort of say, you know, I'm not going to be making the decision about whether you transition. In the end, it's going to be you. My advice would be take your time, slow things down. There's a lot at stake. A lot can change. That's my advice. But in the end, because otherwise, if you're in a sort of battle, the kid goes, the parents have appointed this guy. It's, it's in the papers what he thinks. I'm either going to go, okay, I'm going to go along with this until my parents basically go, okay, a psychological evaluation is done. We'll give them a green light. Or else you're in a sort of dogfight, neither of which are helpful psychologically. But just to make it clear, my individual position would be very different from my position in terms of the policies that we should be pursuing to this whole area. How are you sleeping? Sleep is a foundation of mental and physical health, equally important to nutrition and exercise, yet it's often the first thing to go during times of stress. Good sleep can help alleviate depression and anxiety symptoms, maintain a healthy weight and metabolism, protect your heart, and even reduce the risk of Alzheimer's. 
Yet still, a third of Americans struggle with sleep, and temperature is one of the main reasons. Before I got an eight sleep, I was already an expert in sleep hygiene and practiced what I preached to my clients, but I would still wake up overheated in the middle of the night and unable to fall back asleep for one or two hours. Adjusting the air temperature and blankets was not enough. The mattress itself was keeping me hot. But now I'm sleeping soundly through the night and waking up refreshed thanks to my 8sleep Pod Pro cover. The Pod Pro cover by 8sleep is the most advanced solution on the market for thermoregulation. It pairs dynamic cooling and heating with biometric tracking. The cover can adjust the temperature on each side of the bed individually for you and your partner based on your sleep stages, biometrics, and bedroom temperature, reacting intelligently to create the optimal sleeping environment. If you'd like to be more patient with your children, more emotionally stable with your partner, a fitter athlete, or more efficient at work, take it from me, a mental health professional, Improving your sleep is one of the best investments you can possibly make in your overall well-being and the lives of everyone you touch. Go to 8sleep.com to check out the pod and use the code SOMETHERAPIST at checkout to start sleeping cool this summer with up to $200 off your purchase. Even if they're already running another sale, this code will get you an additional $50 off. And yes, to my listeners around the world, 8sleep currently ships not only within the USA, but also to Canada, the UK, select countries in the EU, and Australia. All right, now back to the show. I think it is, it's such a fine line, and it's one reason that I've pulled back from working with individuals with gender dysphoria, and I really just focus on helping parents who are worried about their kids and helping the parents with their distress, because I do hold a belief that is in keeping with what almost all therapists agreed on until very recently, which is that we should always seek to alleviate distress with the least amount of harm, right? I mean, we always held the belief that, for instance, if if our client was in a lot of harm and the choice was between shooting up heroin and smoking cigarettes, well, the cigarettes are better, right? And if it's between cigarettes and junk food, the junk food's better. But if it's between junk food and a mindfulness practice, well, then let's help you get to the mindfulness practice, right? And we want to increase someone's coping tools so that they're going from more self-destructive habits to habits where they're working with their emotions to live more creative meaningful, connected lives. That's always been what I want for people. I always want their health and well-being, and I want to provide the treatments that are the minimum necessary, medically necessary, that are going to come with the least amount of harm. And so, you know, you wouldn't recommend that someone take benzos every day for a routine anxiety disorder. The most invasive treatment a medical professional should recommend for an anxiety disorder would be a standard anti-anxiety medication, not a highly addictive one. But if their anxiety can be alleviated through psychotherapy, even better because then you don't have to take a pill. So I've always been on the side of the least amount of harm, the least amount of invasion, and you know the fewest amount of kind of negative ripple effects in a person's life. So I, I definitely hold a bias that seems pretty sane and reasonable to me. And I would hope to be able to instill hope in clients that, hey, good news, this thing that you're presenting distress over, I have faith that we can help alleviate this distress in a way that's not costly or invasive, that doesn't come with a lot of side effects. And I just think it's absolutely insane that we live in a climate right now where that's controversial when it comes to gender, where we can't say, hey, I get that what you've been told is that the solution to your problems is to basically become a lifelong medical patient. But I have faith that you can, you can struggle through this. And it's very likely that a few years from now, you can be okay in the body that you have. And I want to talk about the polarization that you mentioned too, because you talked about trying to avoid getting into this dogfight with your patients. And I want to frame that in terms of a few psychological terms that are, you know, therapists will be familiar with, but lay people might not. So cognitive dissonance and projective identification. So for those who aren't familiar, projective identification is a 
an interesting way that a psychological defense plays out. So let's say I knew Marcus in a different context and projective identification was coming up. Let's see, I projected onto Marcus that he was my cold, judgmental, abandoning father. And then I start behaving around Marcus in a way that I would behave around that type of person. Then he starts to feel that way himself. He starts to feel cold and rejecting and judgmental toward me, even though he might not have felt that way in a different context. Well, Marcus and I have just engaged in a process of projective identification where I projected something onto him and the way that I've acted out that projection, he started to identify with it, take on those feelings, and then maybe act them out unconsciously. As therapists, one of the reasons that it's important for us to be able to recognize our countertransference or our feelings to our patients is to be able to catch that and utilize it to the benefit of our understanding of our patient, our ability to help them rather than playing out unconsciously. I think when we get into power struggles, oftentimes in therapy, that is a process of projective identification. So for instance, a patient might come to me saying, I really want to stop drinking. I don't know why I drink so much. I don't think it's good for me. In To switch models for a second from psychodynamic to inter internal family systems, in an internal family systems model, that would be the manager part of the client showing up, you know, that kind of responsible adult self saying, I should really get my problems under control. And I would view it as my part of my responsibility professionally to try to understand not just the part that's saying I want to change, but also all the other parts that are pulling that person in different directions that are contributing to why they are drinking. But if I was letting projective identification happen in therapy, then I would allow the patient to project onto me that I'm the part of them that wants them to stop drinking, right? I'm the authority figure to whom they've, you know, said, I have a problem, I should get better. And then they start projecting onto me that I have that agenda for them. Right. And then instead of being there to help work with all parts of them and help them explore their own ambivalence that's keeping them in this pattern with alcohol. Well then now I'm I'm containing that part of them that wants to stop drinking and then they double down on the part of them that doesn't want to stop drinking, right? Then they start protesting with me and then I'm like, "Wait a minute, how did this happen? I don't have that agenda for this person. I mean, I am here to help them get better, and I know that that does mean that they don't have to drink so much, but now I'm in a power struggle." So, what I think happens a lot of times in the the polarization and the fights over gender is that young, naive, immature people will engage in a process of protective identification with the authority figures around them, like their parents and all those supposed bigots online and maybe a therapist such as yourself. They're, and in the process, they're splitting off their own cognitive dissonance, right? Because we know that it's stressful for the human mind to contain many different conflicting thoughts, opinions, and desires at the same time. And we normally try to minimize that stress by reducing cognitive dissonance in various ways that could include denial or rationalization, but also projection, right? So it's normal if I'm thinking about making some kind of lifelong decision that I should feel some kind of ambivalence about that, that a part of me would go, are you sure this is a good idea? This is a really big thing to do. But I think that projection is kind of an immature coping mechanism and it's natural for people who are immature to project their ambivalence outward onto an authority figure such as yourself or a parent, then engage in projective identification as a way of minimizing their own cognitive dissonance. So I can see how you're walking a fine line because on the one hand, you and I both know that gender dysphoria can be alleviated through much less invasive means. But on the other hand, we have to be really careful not to allow the cognitive dissonance to be projected onto us and to engage in this kind of power struggle. That's my own kind of kind of working psychodynamic model <laughs> for conceptualizing these power structures. And as a psychoanalyst, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on it. Well, we, we all project. You know, we, we all project. And when we're under pressure, we all project, you know, massively. You know, we, we only recover ourselves when we, we sort of over come the sort of crisis or whatever but i but i think you're right i mean i think the the thing is is that the the, the argument that goes on isn't it is that all the doubts and anxieties are usually located in the the adult or the therapist or all the certainty is located in the in the young person and and the reason for that is that 
I think confusion and doubts are felt to throw the mind into into sort of chaotic state. It feels a threatening state, and that that often what the, what the individual is wanting to do is to sort of shut down on that sort of confusion and chaos. One of the things that often gender clinics say, as if it was, it was evidence of the sort of correctness of, of the, the fact that the child should transition, as they say, well, they were absolutely certain. Now, a bit like you're saying, see, I would see certainty in this area as symptomatic of a prob- problematic state of mind. One, if one's making a serious decision with serious long-term implications, you know, it's right that you have doubts and maybe confused, not be sure. So I think, you, I think you're right. It gets played out you know, between the therapist and the, and, the, and the individual. And in a way, you see, it relates to another thing. I was thinking about another thing you said, you know, that you're going for the least harmful, least invasive sort of method of treatment. But you see, the, 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 the child may think that psychotherapy is the most invasive form of treatment. Of course, I'm not arguing with you about the fact that the medication, you know, has long-term serious consequences, which are irreversible. But the child feels it's the mind that's the threatening thing, as you said earlier on. These children are often very frightened of their minds. And so when they come up against a therapist who says, well, let's talk about your doubts, they say, well, what doubts? I don't have any doubts. I'm certain. It's just... You guys won't give me what we, what I want. Now, what I then do is I'm saying, well, let's, you know, it, it, it's interesting that you you feel your mind feels so threatened by any sort of cognitive dissonance, any doubts, any confusion. You feel you've got to export it. Now, what's that about? Because I I sort of agree with you in terms of not exactly what you were saying, but in terms of having some. You were saying about you know have, having some sort of confidence, you know that things can work out a different way. Well, my investment in that area would be to say, let's see if we can examine why you feel your mind can't can't you look at yourself and tolerate some sort of like I say uncertainty, doubts, because while you think that's something to be avoided, I would say that's something that would be quite healthy. So it comes back to the fragility of their ego, you know, the fact that they feel they've got to control it to such an extent. And as you say, project disturbance and turbulence whilst maintaining this sort of position of certainty. And that's what the therapist is trying to work with, trying to understand that, because you're not the parents. Of course, the parents are driven, driven beside themselves by it, get into rows and fights. Well, actually, parents, there's sort of two sorts. One are terrified of arguing with the, with the child because they feel worried about the threat of suicide. And there's others who just get into fights with them. And both positions are understandable but problematic. The parent that's terrified of the child who's threatening suicide, one thing, like, you know, they're... You're basically being bullied out of your position as as their p- parents and their protectors. The parents who are in an endless dogfight with the child over this issue, you know, it, it, it sort of takes your eye off other things. So it sort of tends to go nowhere. It just ends up as a sort of boxing match. And you, you sort of feel that it keeps out other points of contact or connection, you know. But it's completely understandable, I think, can be unhelpful. I hope you've been enjoying this episode of You Must Be Some Kind of Therapist podcast. If you like what you're hearing, now's a great time to like, subscribe, follow, rate, review, or share. You can also support the podcast by visiting sometherapist.com slash shop, where you will find goods and services I have personally curated to support your well-being and enrich your life. We're just building the shop, so check back periodically and feel free to suggest recommendations. All right, now back to the show. So let's dive back in 
suicide and gender distress. Big crisis going on right now. A lot of parents are in that very difficult position that you described of being posed the Mm. question, would you rather have a dead daughter or an alive son? I have a lot to say on this, but I just want to pose to you, what are your initial (laughs) thoughts on the subject? Yeah, well, I I mean, it's part of the sort of tyranny that the, 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 the parents are under, isn't it? Is that child will say, you know, well, you're not letting me be myself and I'm not going to be happy until I'm allowed to transition and that if I don't, you know, I feel suicidal. Now, the first thing to say is clinically that, that one of the things you come across is a lot of self-hatred. Now, that's not the same as suicidality, but it is hatred of the self. And I, I think that when I talk about trying to understand what's going on beneath the surface, you know, a, a lot of these kids are struggling with hatred of the self, which often gets located in the body or, or identify with the, the, the breasts or with the penis or the secondary sex characteristics. And the, the fantasy is if only they could get rid of those, then they could they'll be free to be themselves. Now, the the next thing is that the sort of this this thing that's banded around, you know, what would you rather have, a a trans child or a dead child? The fact is, is that Michael Biggs, as a researcher in this country, he looked into these sorts of claims and the science behind it. Now, the first thing to say is, going back to the point I made previously about the politicisation, we just don't have the data. We are literally flying blind. Because of the politicisation, because of the sort of hands-off attitude and the lack of curiosity, we 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 just haven't gathered enough data. But the thing that he found was that really that the suicidality of this population is very similar to the, the adolescent population with problems. It's, it's, it's of a similar sort of level. You know, so if you, if you went on to an anorexic unit or adolescent suffering from anxiety and depression, you'd see similar readings of sort of, do you ever think about killing yourself, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's no different. It's no worse and it's no better. Having said that, that's based on other studies that have been done. And I just come back to my point. There's just a lack of research. In terms of parents, it puts parents in a terrible position, you know, whereby they feel that unless they accede to their child's wishes, which they may be fundamentally against or have worries about, then they're going to be facing the threat that the child may harm themselves. As I say, one of the things, and this is really my wife who does this work, we get a lot of parents write to us. The letters are very similar. They often say, our child has had lots of comorbid problems. They've they've been an outsider for a long time. Never any signs of um, gender questioning behaviour as a child. They they hit adolescence. That was difficult for them. And then, you know, they started to go online. And this is the contagion aspect of what you were talking about before. They sort of joined a group that said, oh, you're trans. And then they feel like whilst they don't fit in, they can't find a peer group in the external world. They can find a peer group online. It says, we, we welcome you as you are. Join us. And it, and, it, and it does have a sort of cult-like feeling about it. And then the parents are, they're, they're really worried. Then they go to the statutory services, and the statutory services make them feel that they should be just affirming. And then they're really unhappy, and they think, oh, we're going mad. We don't know where we are. And, and then they'll contact us because of the things that we've said publicly. And we say, no, you're not going mad. In a way, you're right to be worried. You know, the the child needs a thorough psychological investigation. Part of your confusion and disturbance that you're experiencing is actually the thing that they can't tolerate. So, yeah. But it's hard for parents to sort of, like you say, you know, 
it's, it's fight or flight. You know, they're either sort of terrified of causing damage or they're fighting. And actually, you've got to try and find a position. And I'm glad it's not me trying to do this because I completely understand that parents are sort of so upset and disturbed by this. I would be the same. But you're trying to find a position in which you try to go on being the child's parent across the board. Everything gets focused on gender. You know, there's more to life than gender. You know, we're, we're you know, there's... A, they are who they are. Um, I don't want to go to the, the language which I think has been this sort of stolen, which is you're helping them to discover their authentic self because I feel that's contaminated. But in a way, you sort of are in a way. You know, what's behind all this preoccupation with gender? What's going on? But t- parents are in a terrible position. Mm-hmm. Have my Suicide is such a complex topic. Right, because there's suicidal ideation, meaning any kind of thoughts about it, which person might keep to themselves or articulate to someone else. There's parasuicidal behavior, so self harm that's not seriously injurious, like cutting or burning or hitting oneself, right? Then there's suicide threats, where a person is communicating to someone else that if you don't do this or that, or if I don't get my way over this and that, then I'll kill myself. Then there's suicide attempts. You know, when we're screening for thoughts of suicide, it's it's not black and white. As a therapist, if someone tells you that they thought of suicide for any reason, then you want to assess plan, means, and intent, right? You want to find out, have they thought of a specific way that they might do it? Do they have access to that? Do they have the intention to follow through? You're also looking at a lot of other risk factors and protective factors, and all of that needs to be taken into consideration before you make some kind of prognosis or recommendation for hospitalization or any of that, right? And, you know, there are people for whom it's really difficult to come to someone, a parent, friend, teacher, therapist, and say, I've been having these thoughts and they're really scary, right? And we we have... I think some evidence, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but my recollection casually of the evidence is that, you know, it's the people who are silently suffering for a long time and who are less likely to open up about it that are actually more at risk, right, of a completed suicide attempt. And I lost someone to suicide. He was a therapist and he was 40 years old. He was brilliant and helped a lot of people. He talked a lot of people off the ledge himself and he silently suffered. You know, he was that type. And for him, a lot of what we believe, we can't know, but a lot of what we believe led to that was chronic pain and disability. I don't know exactly what condition he had, but I know it was debilitating. And at 40, he was kind of looking at the rest of his life going, am I going to be able to live a meaningful life? And knowing that, is one reason that I feel so concerned for the long-term suicide risk of these kids who are embarking on these medical procedures that are so experimental that are actually really likely to cause long-term pain and disability because that's a huge risk factor. But to back it up a moment, you know, it's the silently suffering types are most at risk of completed suicide attempts. Then you have people who are more at risk of failed suicide attempts, you know. So for example, the kind of classic picture of like severe borderline personality disorder would be someone who's made many unsuccessful attempts at suicide because there's some, you know, secondary gain or attention seeking, uh, although that can sound like kind of a cold way of putting it. But there's just a lot of complexity around this, right? And I think that to people who haven't been trained to understand and work with suicide to the depth that you and I have as experienced therapists, then any talk of suicide is very scary, understandably. And how could that possibly be any scarier than it is to a parent if it's your child saying it? Because it's every parent's worst fear. So of course, parents are going to take that sort of thing really seriously, but it needs to be examined carefully, right? And and. One increasing factor that we really need to look at is the social influence, not just in the conceptualization of what's wrong with a person for their distress, the self-diagnosis, the social influence for conceptualizing of oneself as trans or some other gender identity, but 
the social influence with regard to the messages of suicide. There's a lot of social influence right now for kids who are identifying as transgender. And, you know, 20 years ago, a lot of the things that we talk about or that we hear people talk about just didn't exist, right? There wasn't widespread prescription of puberty blockers to kids exhibiting gender-related distress. There wasn't widespread administration of, of most of these medical procedures. They were novel and rare and used by adults. And, you know, we didn't have kids killing themselves in droves because they didn't have access to something that they didn't know existed. It was sort of invention is the mother of necessity in this case, right? It's the awareness that this is a thing that you can have and that lots of people are raving about how wonderful it is. And that's how you get to be special and belong to your glitter family. And that's what's going to alleviate your distress. It's these ideas that lay the foundation. And then you add to that the messages kids are receiving online and in their peer groups that if you don't get this, you will kill yourself, which is being said. And then there's coaching online, oftentimes with older trans-identified adults who haven't been vetted by the parents, oftentimes, you know, two or three times the age of the kid, coaching in how to use threats of suicide to kind of back parents into a corner, sometimes whether that means taking them to a hospital emergency room where the staff will all affirm and make gender the focus or, you know, kind of whatever that next step is. But this didn't emerge in a vacuum. This didn't exist before. We didn't have, you know, it's not like we just discovered the cure to a long-term problem we've had with youth suicides. Have we had problems with youth suicides in the past? Yes, of course. But was it always because of this untreated problem with gender dysphoria that now we have a treatment for? I don't think that's the case. It's it's what they're learning from other people that's planting this idea that if they don't get these things that didn't even exist in recent history, that they will kill themselves, right? And that's just the worst position for a parent to be in. And it's, I think, recklessly irresponsible for clinicians to perpetuate this myth that this is how you're this is how you're going to handle it. You're going to give them exactly what they want. That's not how we've ever handled anything before. You know, if in the past, if a kid was saying, if you don't give me alcohol and porn, I'm going to kill myself, you know, the, and we never said, well, parents, I guess you know what the solution is. It's to give your 15 year old alcohol and porn, right? It's always like, wait a minute. There are things that we can do mm. about this, you know, in the short term. There are safety plans that we can make. There are ways that parents can keep their kids safe at home with help from a therapist. And there are ways to work on that suicidal distress. But when the kids are fixated on this idea that they have that they have in mind, that they've learned from social influence, then it makes it very hard to talk about. And I think a lot of people are just too scared to even be able to think about this clearly. The other thing I wanted to talk about with really with regard to suicide that I don't think we're talking about enough is, as I mentioned earlier, the long-term suicide risk. So as I mentioned, you know, mm. I lost a friend to suicide who was not the sort of person you would think would be at risk. I mean, he was a therapist, right? And we know that if you look at all the data we have on suicide of risk factors and protective factors, some of the worst risk factors include chronic pain and disability, anything that takes away from a person's ability to, mm -hmm. to live a meaningful life where they're, you know, working and being productive and enjoying hobbies. And we know that social support is one of the biggest protective factors and social support in in an ideal world, for most people, that means a happy romantic partnership, right? Which includes sexual pleasure. So we know that right now kids are engaging in medical procedures that will, for many of them, permanently stop them from ever being able to experience orgasm or other forms of sexual pleasure. It's going to be harder for them to find partners because of this. And there, I think, are kind of a lot of negative consequences for relationships, plus the protective factor of family, of responsibility to your children. And if you 
were sterilized at the age of 14 and at the age of 30, if you decide you have, you want children, tough luck, these kids are not going to be able to have their own biological children if they were to want that in the future, even if they think they don't want it now. So, you know, we're basically setting these kids up to increase the amount of risk factors and decrease the amount of protective factors for suicide by a lot. And that really scares me. I've also seen evidence that the long-term risk of suicide for people post-transition is 19 times higher, that the time of most risk of suicide is about 10 years post-transition. And so adding all this together with the exponential rise in the transing of children over the last few years, I'm looking 10, 20 years out and seeing a tidal wave of detransitioners who are going to need a whole lot of help to protect them, as well as people who maybe never detransition but encounter some kind of crisis where they're at higher risk of suicide. And when a person has spent many important developmental years fixating this on this as the solution to their problems, and they haven't worked on their physical or mental health in any other way because they thought that this was what it was all about, and then this falls apart, I think they're going to be left in an incredibly fragile position. So that's worrying me a ton, and I, I wanted to talk about it with you today, Marcus. Again, lots of things you raise. I mean, one is the sort of full science that dogs this whole area because of the vacuum really in sort of hard science and all the sort of claims. And as you say, there's a lot of coaching that goes on online and so and kids are given the tools to put pressure on the adults, etc. And that's also unhelpful. In terms of suicidality, I mean, as I say, I used to I used to run a parasuicide service in the 1980s, at our, a casualty department. The thing is, as you say, it's often people who d- don't talk about their state of mind that are highest risk. But human nature being what it is, we're sort of unpredictable. I mean, as you say, there's all sorts of statistics and disability and pain you know, push you up. The, the sort of statistical risk ladder, as do being isolated. You're, you're right about all that. At the end of the day, it always comes down to what these factors mean to the individual. You know, why, it's very sad to hear about your friend, you know, why he suddenly felt that, you know, that the protective factors weren't enough or life became so difficult. It's always... You can get into the sort of ballpark of who's at risk and who isn't, but you never know why an individual. Now, the reason I say that is you get people with very few um, risk factors who kill themselves, and then you get people with very high risk factors who don't. I used to have a guy who used to say he was going to kill himself. I used to run a day hospital as well. He said he'd kill himself every every day that I worked, and and, I, and it was almost just like saying hello, and in the end he did. So, you know, you just got to, we're not very good at predicting human behavior, although we've always got to try, you know, as, as mental health practitioners. But I think your point about the, the new population is very important. So for the first 25 years of my time in psychiatry, we were talking about very small numbers in this country, the UK, over 18s. 90% male to female in there, sort of from 25, 18, 25 onwards. Now we're talking about this huge increase, con- complete change in the demographic. We're talking about 12, 14, 15 year old, 85% female to, to male transitioners. So, a completely different population. And the fact is, is we, as I said before, we're just flying blind. We don't know what the outcome is going to be. But you're right, it's it's worrying. I don't know whether it will be the, the catastrophe for everyone that you fear it will be. I mean, not you know, large numbers. You didn't say everyone, but 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 the fact is, we just don't know. And and the contagious aspects that you've talked about, they're also very influential. A lot of people are being sucked into this at a very early and vulnerable age. Now, the thing is, is that what what you see is that 
for some individuals, you know, we think it's a psychological problem. They concretely feel the problem is located in their sexuality and they can't, they don't feel they can establish a mind of their own or a body of their own without removing this unwanted bit. So I've written a paper about girls transitioning to boys. There's been a sort of battle over the feminine body. You know, whose body is it? I feel like my I'm very dependent on the mother. It feels like the, their body is the mother's possession. So how do they become a sexual woman when they feel often feel there's a feeling of betrayal by the mother, that they were quite anxiously attached child, they may have been displaced by a younger sibling. There's a sort of feeling that maternality and sexuality has left them sort of on the outside. So there's a hatred of their feminine characteristics which are going to lead to the next generation if they have kids and one thing or another. They, they, They don't want anything to do with it. Now you're trying to help them say, well, you know, is, is, is a concrete solution the only solution to this problem? You know, could you, could you see that, you know, there might be other ways of thinking about this? And one of your problems is how are you going to find room for you as a sexual person, you know, who's got a body and mind of your own, not the belonging belonging to your mother but not a sort of against your mother as it were you know it's a sort of unconscious battle between the generations so you're trying to think about that you know uh, as i say who knows what the outcome will be but you know that th- that some people make a successful transition i'm sure that's true the problem is we have got no way and i don't believe anybody has got any way of knowing who are going to be the casualties and who are going to be the ones who make good transitions. Often, this goes back to my original uh, point about assessment of suicide. See, there's often a wish in psychiatry to claim that we can predict as if we could identify true trans. Now, I used to be in charge of the adolescent department, adult and adolescent department at the Tavistock. And in the adolescent department, we were very cautious about, about pinning our sort of, what should I say, pinning much, much sort of belief in the diagnostic criteria for adolescence. The reason being is that even in the adult population when it comes to mental health, if you've been in a psychiatric institution, you pick up sort of 20 different diagnoses over the years. Well, in the adolescent population, it's even more difficult to predict who you know, someone who presents as a borderline personality disorder, who's going to go on to develop borderline personality disorder, who's going to resolve and never have any long-standing psychological difficulties. You just don't know. So I am I would take a lot of persuading that we have the capacity to identify who true trans are. I think, I think it's pie in the sky. Doesn't it doesn't add up with anything I know about psychiatry and particularly adolescent psychiatry? So I put that to one side. Then, as you say, the thing is, what what I what I did used to see in Kings in the nineteen eighties was people who they had long standing problems. They believed that transitioning was going to cure the problem. They would have, the ones I'm thinking of, had sexual reassignment surgery. They then discover they've still got the same problems, that actually nothing had changed apart from the medical interventions, and then they would be suicidal and uh, taking overdoses and coming into kings. Because, as I say, they get, they get disillusioned. The cure hasn't worked. Now, we also know because a lot of um, the the things that detransitioners write is that often they are sold a belief that almost they can change sex. You know, that there's very little talk about what the real implications are um, for transition and the shortfall between what they would ideally like to become 
and what medical science can actually produce. It's quite a gap. As, as you've indicated, they're going to have long-term, you, you know, you've got to either go on taking the medication for the rest of your life. Surgery has complications. So you're going to have to live with a lot of suffering and also the shortfall between what you're aiming for and what you're actually going to experience. Now, some people, they're, they're, there is enough reality-based thought that they can tolerate the gap, the loss, as it were, between the image and the reality. And for others, it's, it, the gap is very large, and that, as you say, is likely to increase psychological distress. Again, so I, I sort of agree with you. I think there's going to be a sting in the tail of this large group of new people going through into this, this area. We already see it on, on Reddit, you know, the number of detransitioners saying, you know, I, I was basically, this was missold goods, and I wasn't really, it wasn't really explained to me, or I was so determined I wasn't interested. And then there's a large gap between what they were aiming for. And I just there's one other point that you, you brought up, and that was about the sort of medicalization that's going on in our culture. We did a thing in the adult department um, of the Tavistock. It was called the Depression Study, in which we treated people with chronic depression with uh, psychotherapy for 18 months. But part of that, and that was a sort of randomised control trial, but part of the the sort of background information was looking at the diagnosis of depression over the years. And it's completely linked, the, the number of people diagnosed in society is very much linked to the drugs available. So I think, I think the first one's the MAOIs. So, so depression was a very small diagnosis, very small percentage of the population. Then the first drugs came along. I don't know, I don't know my history, 1950s. And, the, and the, the net that describes depression then increased. And you've got more people taking the drugs. Then there's the tricyclics and the nets increased again. And then it's increased again until... All sorts of things. You go into the see the GP, and you have what we would have described in the 1980s as the blues is now described as depression, and there's a pill for it. And I think that's going on in society. You know that, that psychiatry is it's, it's like a land grab, as if we're sort of as our belief. In medication is the solution to psychological di- difficulties, more drugs on the market, the sort of pool in which sort of what you might call ordinary human suffering is now being pulled into a sort of psychiatric category. And it's very much related to the medication. I'm not against medication, by the way, but I do think there's a tendency to sort of... I don't know, we've blurred the boundary between what I would call ordinary human suffering and serious mental illness. And it's very much related to the drug company's capacity to produce these medications and our wish to believe that the pill is going to solve the problem. Rather than some things are we, we're having to live with or find a way of coping with or... As I say, I'm not anti-psychiatry and I'm not anti-drugs, but I, I do think it's a modern phenomenon that we're seeing. There's a there's a medical solution for everything, mm-hmm. and that's. I'm not sure we're any better off for it. That's the world <laughs> adolescents are growing up in. That, that anything is is yeah. a trauma. Anything is an emergency, right? And it's it's our role as adults to help orient young people in those moments. Like here's, here's what you're experiencing. I mean, think about the first time a kid experiences a minor injury, a sprain, a skinned knee, right? And they're in pain. They don't have any context for that pain. It's distressing, right? It's, it's our job to comfort them, tend to the wound and 
normalize that this is a minor injury and, and you know, this will just take a few days to scab over or this will hurt for you a few hours and then it'll calm down. And that's also the job of doctors and therapists is to say, here's what you're going through. Here's the typical prognosis. Here's about how severe it is. You know, you don't have anything to worry about because 60% of people have this and it's no big deal. And I feel like young people aren't getting that right now. And they're getting this collusion of the adults around them saying, oh no, it's everything is a big deal. Everything is a crisis. And really it's our job to be able to sort out what, what is and isn't and to help calm that distress by helping kids orient to their distress and, and the distress of puberty in particular right now. You talk about the fantasy versus reality of what what people expect from transitioning. And I think that's a really important point. And I just want to put in a plug for episode seven. <laughs> I was like, which episode was that? I believe it was episode seven, my interview with Helena Kirshner, who talks about detransitioning. And we we went into depth about the fantasy versus reality and what that was like for her. And there's not time to go into these things to great detail, but I'm really glad that you brought that up. Since we are nearing the end of our time, I was curious to hear any advice that you would give to parents as well as advice for therapists. Just to say, your, your point about pain and trauma, I think is, is a point we found ourselves writing about in the book, The you know, that of course you don't ignore pain, but you do help the child orientate themselves. The difference between a pain that you need to go down to the hospital or a pain that's a headache they're both uncomfortable but one you know you respond to one in one way and another in another way always being comforting as you say and trauma's the same trauma's been you know um there's there's been a blurring between different sorts of trauma and i don't think that's always helpful advice yeah i mean i think parents have got to be really skeptical you know they they they're they're in a position to protect their child. They got to, in, unfortunately in this area you've got to be skeptical and questioning and don't believe the experts. Keep your wits about you. Ask questions, and and sometimes you know trust your own judgment. As I say, I think the difficulty is whilst not. I'm not advocating a sort of free for all in re- in regard to. I mean, I'm against children taking medication under 18s. You know, but I'm, I don't. I don't think under 18s should be pursuing a medical path. I've 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 said what I think about over 18s. I think in the end, it's up to the individual. But I'd be for a very thorough psychological investigation. But I, I do think finding that sort of balance of of sort of holding on to your sort of parental position but without getting caught in the continual trap of fight or flight you know uh, flight you know that that's not helpful it's a sort of collapse and fight is also one needs to sort of step back and try and think about the child as a whole that's that's the thing you know i'm trying to i'm trying to think about and and sometimes i think you see, there can be a big noise, like a big issue that is is grabbing everyone's attention that you're in a battle with. I'm always interested in the noises off. What are the more silent aspects, the unspoken aspects that haven't, you know, got on the stage and trying to listen out for what's not front and centre? Because often the thing that's being avoided is n- is not the issue that you're sort of rowing about. It's the, it's the issue that's being pushed out of the picture. But sim- p- p- parents have m- got my sympathy, and you need groups that support you. You know, I think I think we've got a group here called Bayswater, and there are other groups about. You need a support group so that you don't feel you're going mad. As far as therapists are concerned, I, I think the same. I think. I think in a way you don't want to be doing this work on on your own. I think you need supervision. I think you need peer support. And again, I, for my money, I'd, I'd, I'd again try to get avoid getting pulled into. It's very difficult because sometimes 
you know, the, the, is, is a, an alarming issue and you feel like you've got to sort of force the you know, person to face reality and or else you feel you're failing in your job. And, and I try to, whilst it's not that I don't worry, you know, someone comes to me and says, oh, I'm starting testosterone next week, you know, or feel upset about it. But I, I also try to think, okay, well, look, what's the te- testosterone represent? What are they doing? They're sort of, there's often a belief that testosterone is going to shore up a sort of fragile ego and that you're trying to understand that it's the fragility of their sort of psychological structure, which is what they find hard to tolerate. And I try and pay attention to that. But it's not easy work. But it's not impossible either. I mean, in many ways, you know, this is like self-harm or eating disorders in previous generations. It's, it's, it's ordinary work with troubled adolescents. I want to add to what you've said there. I'm glad that you brought up fight and flight with parents because I feel like I'm ready to do a whole episode on parent burnout. And I don't know who I'm going to do that episode with, but I just see this so much. You talk about the need for a support group. Well, I run one such support group for adults here in Oregon, uh, parents of Uh youth with rapid onset gender dysphoria. And People are quitting their jobs, losing sleep, marriages are dissolving. People, you know, parents' mental health, their own mental health is crumbling because they are so worried, sick about their kids. And, you know, this is a marathon, not a sprint. You got to take care of yourself and catch your breath and try not to get caught up in the reactivity. Um, So I wanted to add that as well. And I also wanted to answer my own question with regard to advice to therapists, because something that's been on my mind a lot lately is, well, and and this goes back to an earlier point, when I express my concerns for the mental health of detransitioners currently, but also increasingly in the future, one more confounding factor in that complex picture is that detransitioners who are going through crises and need therapy will have lost trust in therapists because it was the therapists who unquestioningly affirmed them. And they look back and they feel that they were betrayed by therapists who, in retrospect, they wish had done that more thorough assessment that you were talking about and helped them get to the heart of the issues. So one of my concerns there is that the people who are going to need therapy the most in the next decade or two are the people who are going to be trusting therapists the least. And so my advice to therapists is If you have up until recently been, let's say, a quote unquote affirming therapist, or you have seen the LGBTQ plus as one united community, which hopefully if you've started to do your research, if you've listened to my other episodes, read my blog, you might have had some change of opinion about understanding the complexity and the division within that community. But you know, if you have been type kind of marketing your practice in a way where you're trying to signal that you're affirming or that you're supportive of that, you know, perceived unified community, you're going to see people in your office who gravitate towards that. And you're not necessarily going to be seeing the people who that doesn't work for. So you're not going to be hearing from the parents, the detransitioners, and the other people who experience transition regret or wish that they could have had some kind of different approach. And I I would really encourage therapists to consider who you're not seeing in your office and to listen to some of these stories, whether you prefer podcasts or reading, listen to parents, listen to detransitioners, see what they have to say about how the mental health establishment failed them. You know, I can refer people back to episode three of my podcast, my interview with Jennifer, episode, I believe it was seven with Helena really take those stories into account and think about who might need therapy in the next decade or two. Can you believe that there are people who are going to feel that they were betrayed and traumatized by therapists who followed the affirmation model? And can you consider that there might be some things about how you're currently practicing or how you're currently representing your practice that could actually be alienating for people who need it the most because they see that you've taken a political stance in being Pro transitioning. And also, I invite therapists to really think if if it's possible that there are some people who you have 
quote unquote, affirmed or green lighted through the medical system, how might you feel if you were to learn years down the line that they regretted their transitions and really think about the seriousness and the permanence of the medical procedures that your patients might be undergoing. I I think a lot of therapists don't want to think about this because they're just so sure that they're doing the right thing because they went to the kinds of trainings that I went to before um, my perspective on this changed. And really consider that this might even be a crisis for you as a therapist to realize that you thought you were doing the right thing and actually you inadvertently harmed people. And just to please take this seriously, even if our political views are different, even if our views on gender are different, um, there are still people who are going to need our help and um, our community has lost their trust. So how can we regain the trust of people who are affected by gender issues and how can we prepare for the needs that are going to be um, more apparent in the coming years. Yeah, it's certainly true that a lot of the transitioners that we set up, a, the government's asked a, a woman called Hillary Cass over here to sort of look into the research. And she's basically said, you know, it doesn't, doesn't sort of exist and we should be behaving much more cautiously. But it's difficult to get detransitioners to speak to her because of the distrust of professionals. Um, she's she struggled to find people. Well, thank you for joining me and for doing the work that you're doing. Can you tell listeners who are interested a little bit about your book and any other resources that you offer? The book is about a psychological approach to gender dysphoria and, and looking at the different sort of psychological challenges that children struggle with and trying to understand a bit about why they might land them land on this as a particular solution so um and the other thing is we're doing a teaching we 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 do online teaching with eventbrite in fact we're doing one on wednesday but um we we put them out every now and then a psychological approach to gender dysphoria and what's the full name of your book and where where can people find it rainbow colors gender dysphoria a therapeutic model for working with children adolescents and young adults uh, you can just see my head. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's there we are. Oh, God. by Marcus that's Evans. It. Was your wife, Sue, also involved in writing that? Sue Evans. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it's by both of us. Mm-hmm. And for people who are interested in your trainings, where can they find more information about that? It's on Eventbrite, and it's just called Gender Dysphoria, A Therapeutic Approach. Do you have a website? We have, actually. It's at Evans Psychotherapy. Um, Evans psychotherapy. Yeah, Evan, EV. That's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is that dot co dot uk? Just thinking international. Dot co dot uk. Yeah, it is. UK. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And I know your Twitter handle is long. It's got a bunch of numbers in it, so it might not be the easiest way to find you. No, I I got closed down. <laughs> my my Twitter you handle did. was much simpler, but they shut me down. Yeah. Oh no. Uh, for saying what yeah yeah and and uh oh something like research men are not women or something do research (laughs) (laughs) no 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 nothing like that nothing really just sticking to you know we need more research before medicalizing children it was something like that wow and in fact we were shut i was shut down on twitter and my wife's facebook page which was trying to raise money for the court case wow that was shut down as well i'm sorry to hear that there we are standard well (laughs) your twitter is now it's at marcus e (laughs) followed by a bunch of numbers so i'll just put that in the show notes i i I, i'll 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 send it to you i'll send it to you on email okay yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure. Not at all. Pleasure. Nice to meet you. And all right. um, yeah, good luck with the podcast. And yeah. I hope you enjoyed this episode of You Must Be Some Kind of Therapist podcast with Stephanie Wynn, LMFT. This podcast is produced by Eric and Amber Beals at Different Mix. Special thanks to the talented musician Joey Pecorero for our theme song, Half Awake. 
At sometherapist.com, you can find more information on any topic, guest, resource, product, or service you've heard of here today. You can also follow me on Twitter or Instagram at sometherapist. If you would like to ask a question, suggest a topic, be a guest, or invite me to speak, you can email us at hello at sometherapist.com. You can also send us a voice memo with your question, and we just might play it. Of course, just because I'm some therapist doesn't mean I'm your therapist. This podcast is not a substitute for medical advice. If you need help, ask your doctor or browse your local therapists online. And whatever you do next, please take care of yourself. Eat well, sleep well, move your body, get outside, and tell someone you love them. You're worth it.